this is gonna be a really long video. Let's see if we can't get that straight. Hello, it's Thursday. So my original plan for this week didn't quite turn out, and so instead we've had to go with plan B. <laughs> so this whole thing started with what what I've started calling the baby. Now he's just a little bit of a generic potato, so I decided that I wanted to sort of add a little bit more detail to him than that. But then I overshot the mark. <laughs> And I couldn't resist learning a bunch of new embroidery stitches. So we're doing one based on this guy today. I think they're beautiful. So it turns out that this sort of thing has a name. I'm pretty sure it's known as Cruel, which makes a lot of sense to me, given that uh, projects this complicated can turn into cruel and unusual punishment. Now, you are going to hear a lot of planes circling overhead during today's video. It's impossible to film around them because they are the water bombers. They are going out to a bunch of fires that are in the area. It is fire season. Isn't that fun? They are a good thing because uh, it means that people up there are going to go help the people out there. So we like them. OK, let's talk about tools and materials. So for today's project, you're going to need eight ply, 100 percent acrylic yarn in three colors. You're going to need a black, a yellow and a white. Now, normally I would be filming with grey instead of black, but we're going to try it with the black today because there's not a lot of fine detail or tricky bits that we have to make in our black yarn, and I do think this bee works out better with black instead of grey. You're also going to need a pair of 20mm safety eyes, your 3.5mm hook, pins and needles, scissors, and some stuffing. For the wings, you are going to need some thin wire. Now, I am using something called florist wire, and on the screen right now is literally all the information I have on, on this particular roll, so I just know it's very, very soft. Any kind of armature wire or even sort of a pipe cleaner would do. That's kind of what we're talking about there. And I've also got some needle nose pliers to cut the wire. But that's it. So, a written version of today's pattern will be made available to my patrons and will also be listed on my Etsy. And I will leave links to both in the description down below for anybody who is interested. I do just want to say that the embroidery guide is not going to be included with that pattern. Uh, I am way too new at this as a skill to be teaching anybody anything. We are going to cover it today, but it's not going to be part of the written pattern. So we're going to grab our black and start by working up the first five rows to form his head. So there we are at the end of row five, and now we're going to change color to our yellow. So for this pattern, we always want to change colors in the stitch before you need the new color to be active. So if we're going to start row six in our yellow, we need to change in the last stitch of row five. So I'm just going to frog that stitch there. And the way I work my color changes is by inserting my hook into the stitch, yarning over and pulling up a loop, holding the old color out of the way, grabbing a strand of the color we're changing to, pinching it at the base of the stitch on the inside of the work, yarning over and pulling through both loops, and tug on the tails to tighten the stitch down. And that leaves me with a completed single crochet in my old colour, but my new colour on my hook ready to go. So at this point I'm not going to trim my black off, but I'm not going to carry it around with me either. We're going to work four rows in our yellow and then change back to our black, but we'll just pull it up from where it's currently attached when we need to at that point. So now we're going to carry on and do our yellow band. So row six starts with three single crochet. And then we're going to do a section where we load a lot of increases around the top side of your B. So we're going to work two repeats of an increase and then two single crochet. That's just going to help build out his little like rough. And then an increase, and then a single crochet, and you're going to mark that single crochet because it indicates the top of his head, and that will just help us position our eyes later. You can then carry on and finish off the row. So that should leave you with one full round of yellow. And then we're just going to work the next three rows in our yellow. So 
changing back to our black in the final stitch. So there we go. You'll note that my marker is still in, marking the top of his head, because otherwise you will lose it, okay? Trust me on that. <laughs> We're then just going to go ahead and work up six more rows in our black, and then four more rows in our yellow. So there we are at the end of row 19 and we're just going to stop and pop our eyes in now. So because we marked the top of his head this shouldn't be too difficult though I swear I've put the eyes in crooked on all three of these that I've made so far. We're going to do our best today. So our little marker is at the top of his head and then we want the eyes to go into row four. So one, two, three and four. And I'm going to start mine out on the sides of his head and then you can move them sort of slightly up towards one another if you prefer. And that is where I'm going to put my eyes. So now I'm just going to snap my backs on. Ah, it's the return of the pop sound. Yay. You can also choose to put a little bit of stuffing in at this point if you like, but we're going to stuff it more firmly later. So in row 20 we're going to change colours part of the way through the row and that is just to keep the slight jaggedness caused by the colour changes located underneath the bee instead of creeping up his side. So we're going to start with five yellow, changing to our black in the fifth stitch. And you can take your stitch marker out now, you don't need it anymore. Then you can carry on and finish off the round with 31 black single crochet. Like so. Then we have just one round of 36 single crochet in our black. Then row 22 is a split row again. So we're going to work two single crochet, a decrease, and then two single crochet, changing to our yellow in the second single crochet. And you're then going to just complete the round in your yellow, working five repeats of two single crochet, a decrease, and then two single crochet. This should bring your round down to 30 stitches in total. And at this point you can trim off your black. We are done with it. So from here you can work up the rest of your rows in your yellow, making sure that you stop to stuff quite firmly two to three rows before you finish off. And finish off. So there is our cute little jelly bean. Uh, you'll note that he does have an opening at the end. What you're going to do is insert your hook through the front loops of each of the remaining six stitches and pull that remaining tail through. And pull to close. I'm just gonna tuck that away inside there. Nobody has to know about it. His markings have been modelled loosely on the bumblebee, so depending on what bee you do, you might want more even stripes than this, but this is what he looks like today. So, if you're planning on adding decorative stitching to your bee, now is the time to do it. If you're just planning on making a regular bee who will end up looking like this, just skip ahead to the legs timestamp on the timeline down below. Bye. Right, now that they're gone, I'm going to show you how I did each of the stitches that I used on my fancy bee. But first I just need to make a little disclaimer. I don't think I did any of these stitches correctly. So while I did my best with a lot of them, I ended up having to make little adjustments to how to do them in order to get a similar result to how the original stitches looked. I don't know if it was to do with the friction caused by using acrylic yarn, the fact that I was using a curved needle, or just a case of stupid fingers, but Things just weren't necessarily always turning out when I was doing things the way I was supposed to. So I changed things a little bit to the point where I probably shouldn't be using the names that I'm using for the stitches that I used. However, 
I wanted to use the official names for the stitches I was aiming for so that if anybody is interested in seeing how to do them properly, they knew what to look up. So you could just type it into Google and there's plenty of experts out there who will show you exactly how to do the stitches that I'm kind of fumbling my way through. <laughs> Alrighty, so we're going to start with the little French knots on his forehead. I kind of like these ones because I thought they looked like pollen. So yeah, I kind of thought a B would be ideal for this because he's already carved up into the individual sections. So this is my stunt B for today and he is going to help me show you how to do the, the stitches that I did. So I started by using pins to mark exactly where I wanted them to go. So just a little bit like that. And then I threaded my needle with some of the color I wanted them to be. So I am using the exact same needle that I use to assemble my crochet creations every week. Um, not any kind of special needle and this is the same yarn that I used to make the bee. Okay, so this is how I made my French knots or what I'm calling French knots. Uh, I inserted my needle and I got it to poke out of the head where I wanted one of the knots to sit. So I'll take the pin out and I pulled it all the way through. Piece of yarn is perhaps a little bit long, but it'll do for today. So then what I did is I worked my needle, not through the exact same opening, but pretty close. I wanted to go back into the head roughly where my yarn is coming out, but I also wanted my needle to be really close to that little gap as well. And this time I'm not pulling it all the way. I'm pulling up kind of a loop, something that should be fairly familiar to all crocheters. And I'm stopping it at about there. <laughs> and then what I did is I got my needle and I wrapped my active yarn around the loop three or four times. Now I believe these are usually done by wrapping the yarn around your needle but I just found that um, with the acrylic yarn catching the way it did I just could not get them to work that way so this is kind of my workaround. So then I just Finish pulling it tight, scooting it down the strand, and then we finish it by inserting our hook under where the knot is sitting and up through where we want the next knot to be. And what you end up with is a, an approximate French knot. Anybody who knows what they're doing is probably spitting mad in the comments right now, but good. Tell me what I did wrong. I want to be better. So we're going to do another one here. So once again, I've got my yarn coming out where I want the knot to sit. And then I'm going to work a tiny little stitch, essentially right on top. Pulling it through until there's just this little loop remaining. And then wind my yarn around it. Let's say three times, four seems to be a little bit big. Three, so it looks like that. And then you just sort of pull your strand and I scoot the whole lot down to the head as I do it to stop it getting stuck. There's another one. And then once again, inserting our needle basically under the knot and then out where you want the next knot to be. This time pulling it all the way. There's a the second little French knot. And these are actually pretty fun to do. I'll, I'll do one more just really quickly because they're fun. And I, I, the way I do them is probably a little bit more fiddly than doing them the, the proper way, but at least this way I don't end up with very strange looking knots. They at least look approximately like what I think they should. So that is our first stitch. So next up we're going to be doing something called the Lazy Daisy Stitch. So you can see here, they are what formed these pale yellow flowers around little neck ruff. So once again I'm going to use my pins to space them out. So I've used a mix of full daisies and half daisies. So I'm going to use different colors to indicate different types. So I'll use maybe some orange for halves, maybe purple for a full one. So that's a little patch that I'll do for now. You, for this one here I was a little bit more freeform and chaotic. Uh, you can obviously plan these quite precisely if you are that sort of person who has that kind of control over their life, which I'm, I'm just, I'm just not. And that's okay. I'm going to use a different yellow for this. So there we go. I'm going to use a, a brighter yellow for these particular stitches because I want them to stand out a little bit more. And I'm going to start with a little half daisy. So 
what you do is start off by just inserting your needle from anywhere in the work and then up through where the center of your first flower is going to be. So again, pulling nearly all the way through. I like to leave just a little tag sticking out so I can tell that I haven't pulled too far and then I just tuck that in afterwards. So then these stitches are really fun. <laughs> So how the stitches work is you work them in a semicircle or a circle around your center point. So I'm going to insert my needle back through the center point and then out to where I want the edge of the petal to be. And once again, we are pulling up a loop. And then I'm going to pull my needle through that loop before it gets too tight, which is going to make it catch in a little loop shape <laughs> and then insert my needle back basically where it's poking out of the work at this point and then back up through the middle again for the sake of this I suggest having um, the middles of your flowers occur in one of the gaps between the stitches because otherwise poking your needle th like through a piece of yarn a million times won't be good for it but uh, if you use the gaps between the stitches to your advantage they will help you space out your work and save you from a lot of wear and tear. Though I suppose it might just felt the stitch as well. So there is our first petal. Uh, mine are six petaled flowers. So like that's the edge of one of my petals. My half flowers only have four, but I can see that I've made them three stitches wide. So let's one, two, three. That's where the petal on the other side needs to go. And then it's a little bit trickier on the diagonal. Oh, I want them to be a bit smaller than that. I've made my flower a little bit big. That's going to happen. We'll just move that one along a little bit. So the stitch again, insert through the middle of your flower out to where the edge of the petal is going to be. And then you can just poke your needle through the loop so that as you pull it up, it gets caught. And then back in where it poked out from. There's a lot of that in embroidery apparently. And then back out through the middle of the flower. There's our second petal. So I'll just finish off this little half flower now. So when I was making these, I thought they were my favorite stitches and um, they were until I got to a stitch I do later. Now you can use pins to space these out roughly evenly, but remember that a little bit of chaos is a good thing. Now I'm having fun with these, so I'm going to just do another one and show you like the full circle. So the full circle should have six. So I start by doing one to either side of my starting point. Sure, now I can do a dainty little lazy. That's, that's great. It's one to one side and I'll do the one to the other side. And then I know I have to fit two into each of these sides. So that's a lot easier than trying to like visualize six petals evenly spaced. I only need to do two. So that's those two on top and then two more down below. And you'll be able to see here what I was talking about regarding making sure the middle of your flower is the gaps between the stitches as you'll see like we've gone through it now 10 times and I'm about to do two more <laughs> as well so it does add up so yeah and then out anywhere else on the bee is good Tuck. so there is another little lazy daisy so I just continued those around and filled in as much of the space as you can see here, as I was comfortable with, with the lazy daisies. And then I literally just went through and filled all of the gaps that I could see between the flowers with more of the French knots, which are done exactly the same way as we did on his head. Or you could just leave them as daisies and let your crochet stitching show in between. But because I did this original guy on a completely gray base, I felt the need to fill in as much of the space as possible. So the next stitch we're going to do is called either turkey or loop stitch. And I'm gonna just tell you right off the bat, I do this one wrong. And if you do it the way I do it, you're also doing it wrong. So on my original, I did this in black. I'm gonna do it in gray today in the hopes you'll be able to see it. 
we're filling out this black stripe in the middle. So the way I do what I'm calling turkey, start by inserting your hook and just sort of poking it out anywhere. I use my crochet stitches here to help keep everything the same width. And then all I'm going to do is kind of go one stitch back towards my starting point and then stitch under where my starting stitch is and then stitch two stitches back away from my starting point. So hopefully you can see that on camera there. Hopefully that explanation makes some sense. And then we're not pulling it the whole way through. You can leave these as long or as short as you like. And the way normal turkey works is that I think you're supposed to do a little stitch to lock that in. But what I do instead is I uh, insert my hook through the stand strand of yarn down into the opening from the first one and then up one more stitch to the right. So by working through the yarn itself, that's going to stop it pulling free, but it's also not at all how you're supposed to do this stitch. That's how I did this stitch. And uh, we're not pulling it all the way. We're just trying to get them all roughly the same height. You can use pins to help space these out as well if you needed, but I'm just using the crochet itself. So I'll do a couple more along so you get like the idea. And then as I worked, I just sort of started holding them up out of the way being very careful to work through the yarn to lock each stitch at least reasonably into place. Uh, and then I just worked as many rows as I needed to to fill out the whole thing. Now keep in mind the longer your loops are the fluffier your bee is going to be. And then to finish off each row or each strand of yarn I just was very careful to insert my hook once again through the strand of yarn from the previous stitch and then just out through the body Except this time we're going to pull that final stitch tight to lock it into place. So there is the first few loops. That's how we made his little woolly jacket. The final step being you just come along and give him a haircut. And when you have several layers of this, it's far more impressive. And I think with my original as well, I also trimmed these off a little bit shorter. Just to help him keep his girlish figure. What I'm loosely calling turkey. Now we use that same stitch again for this second stripe. It's just instead of pulling them up into sort of longish loops and then trimming them down, I've just done very short loops. So it's the exact same stitch, so I'm not going to show you that one again. But what I am going to show you next is my new favorite stitch. So the woven wheel stitch is too much fun. That's what how I made these little like rosettes in a couple of different colors and a couple of different sizes. So this stitch did become my favorite. And they're going to be your favorite too. They are. They're going to be your favorite. <laughs> Once again, with the bright yellow on my needle, we're going to pretend we're not beings of pure chaos. And we're going to mark roughly where we want our big wheels and our small wheels to go. Now, I would actually suggest marking your big wheels only at first, but space them out so you've got room for some little wheels in between, because I do think the variation looks good. I'll mark a couple fairly far apart. And the way these work is you stitch on five spokes of a wheel and then you do some weaving around and around and around to create the little rosette. So kind of the same way we started our lazy daisies. I'm just going to insert my needle all the way over here. Then up through where I want the center of my first woven wheel to be. Once again, leaving just a little bit out so I can tell if I've pulled too hard. And then I'm going to create five stitches that are the spokes of the wheel. So try and make them the same length and the size of these spokes will dictate how big your little flower turns out. So each stitch I'm just going out to the farthest point I want it to be at and then back through the center. So that's one spoke. Two. You can also measure these with a ruler if, if you need, if you don't like eyeballing stuff. Three. So it's kind of like five pointed star in stickman land. And they are fairly forgiving if you don't get them super even, but just like, just do your best. Some of mine got very, very sloppy the more I stitched them. And uh, turns out it didn't really matter. 
So there we go, I've got my little five pointed star. Then I'm gonna use the back of my needle because it's easier or swap to a darning needle. Okay, piece of advice here, don't use the pointy end of a pointy needle for this. And we're going to start on any of the five strands by inserting our needle under it. Like so. Then we're going over the next one and under the one after that. And we're just going to alternate the whole way around. So over, under. So that's our first lap around. And you'll see we've got this little rosette built up. And we're just going to keep going over and under exactly the same way around until we've filled out the whole wheel. So this actually works with any odd number of spokes. I mean, I would use five as a minimum, but I know that it does also work for like seven and nine. It does not work for an even number of spokes because of the way we're alternating over and under. I'm just pulling it tight. Tucking it under. And around and around we go. I actually think this particular one is very beginner friendly. <laughs> now, if you wanted to add a center to your flower, you could put a little French knot in the middle afterwards. I didn't do that personally on mine, mostly because I was sick of French knots by this point. But also I just didn't think we needed the extra contrast because I'd used so many colors in that area already. So there's probably an official point when you're done with one of these, but for me, the point was when it became too hard to see where all of the little spokes were <laughs> in order to be able to insert my needle under them. So i uh, take that with a pinch of salt, but I'm gonna call that done there. And then finish on an underspoke and just insert your needle down into your B and out into the middle of where you want the next one to be. Like so. So there is our first little woven wheel on this guy. And I'm gonna do another one here. So for these, I alternated between larger ones in a pale color and then smaller ones in my darker color. But then with any gaps that were left between, I just filled in with those turkey slash loop stitches in my black that I showed you how to do before. So there is another little one and you would just carry on and fill out the whole band with those little flowers and finally we're going to be doing a chain stitch so confusingly embroidery slash cruel has a chain stitch that is different to a crochet stitch and that is what I have used to cover his bumbly butt you'll see it kind of looks like a chain but it's attached firmly down so for my original bee I used a little bit of a gradient with these so I started with a dark yellow then a pale yellow then a white for the bumblebee butt uh, but for the sake of demonstration today, I'm just going to do them in the one color. And forgive me, I'm sick of threading my metal needle and it's not really necessary for this particular stitch, so I'm swapping to a darning one. So, to chain stitch, I'm going to insert my needle out to where I want my chain stitches to start. And here is as good a place as any. Because I'm using my plastic darning needle, it's going to basically force me to work just in the gaps between the stitches, which is actually perfect for this particular stitch. So these are basically like the petals of the Lazy Daisy stitch. So I've got my yarn coming out of this little hole here. I'm gonna put my needle back through that hole and out through the next one. And then before I pull that yarn all the way through, I'm gonna catch it with my needle and pull it up as a little loop. So there is my first chain. I'm then going to insert my needle back through where it's currently poking out. So back through inside that loop. And then up through the next one. Once again, catching that loop before it gets pulled tight. And pulling it down to form a second chain. Now, I was really excited when I saw this stitch because suddenly it meant that I could create a foundation row to work crochet through on any surface. And the structural implications for that are pretty exciting to me. Don't know how I'm going to use it, but just be sure that it will be used probably someday to uh, 
desperately overcomplicate something that did not need to be that complicated. <laughs> so yeah, this one here is kind of nice and therapeutic. As you can just like work your way along. And because you're working in the gaps between the stitches, uh, it'll actually take you naturally in a nice easy spiral all the way down to your finishing point if you want to let it. Might have getting a little twisted there. Not sure why. Haven't been doing this long enough to be able to tell you why. Strongly encourage you, if you have any questions about any of this, to uh, Google them. Because <laughs> I will do my best to answer, but the answers will not be correct. And it'll be a flashback to the start of my channel uh, when I wasn't using the correct terminology for anything and just had to break out the sock puppets every time. And I don't think anybody wants to return to those dark days. So yeah, I'm getting carried away there, but I've done like a big long strand of that chain stitching there. And it's just a really cute way to add a little detail and fill in a bunch of your space. Now underneath the only other stitch that I did, that I did was this very sloppy straight stitch, which I think kind of speaks for itself. I've just gone around and around and around. Same thing for the face, because he obviously was not a black bee, he was a grey bee and I had to fill it in black. You won't have to do that for today's bee because you would have done the stripes the way they were supposed to be done. So those are the stitches that I used. Don't feel like you have to do the same ones the same way in the same places that I did. As long as you're having some fun with it, I personally just tried to fill as much of the space on him as possible. So maybe that's a goal for you as well. I will now return you to your regular pattern content. But other than that, we're going to pop that to one side and we're going to make his legs. So for his legs, you're going to grab more of your black. Start with a magic ring of four. Then going to do a round of four single crochet. And then an increase. And three single crochet to get the round up to five stitches. We are then just going to do three rounds of five single crochet for a combined total of 15. And finish off. You don't need to stuff this piece, but I am going to tuck my ends down inside the leg. So there is our first little leg and you're going to need to make five more just like it. Just like so. And we're going to pop those to one side as well. So next up we're going to grab the wire and you're going to want to cut two 9 inch pieces which is about 23 centimeters long. So that's one. So there are my two strands. So what I'm going to do is cross the ends over about half an inch or a centimeter of wire on either side. And just twist those ends together like so. Oh, that is not super visible, but hopefully you can see it a little bit. That's one. And do the same thing on the other. So then all you're going to do is take each one, grab the ends in one hand and the loop in the other, and pull, and then pinch the top to create a little corner, and then pull it into shape. So bees have one long curve and then a corner on the inside of their wing. Now these will probably get warped and bent a little bit out of shape as we work with them, but for now that's a really good starting point. So then we do the same thing to the other one. And there's the basis for our two wings. Now these wings, for anybody who has done any of my insect patterns before, they are not here on YouTube, they are an Etsy exclusive I suppose. Um, these are a little bit different. Uh, in previous versions I've done chain stitches to form the veins. In this one here I've done something that's a little bit easier, I think. So we're just going to start by single crocheting around the entire edge of the wire. So grab your white and attach it to your hook with a slip knot. Then we're going to grab our first piece of wire. And you can use a standing single crochet to do this or you can just slip stitch. To attach around one strand of the wire and then we're just going to place 32 single crochet 
working over the top of the wire. So I'm just inserting my hook underneath the wire, yarning up around it. And working my stitch. Now you'll note that we are sliding around all over the place. That is fine. And what, in fact, what I'm going to do is slide up to this top corner because this is the easiest point to crochet at, I found. Um, you can do however it works for you, but I found that just putting all 32 single crochet into the corner and then just sliding them down later to where we need them to go is, is the easiest way to do this. So that's five, we've got a, lo a long way to go. So that's 32, and that's what I mean about like just working them all into the corner and then just pushing them backwards. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is just uncoil them because they have gotten a little wrapped around and just slide them around the length of the wing. And you want them relatively evenly distributed. I'm then going to slip stitch into the first stitch that we did, which will help hold everything in place and stop it from like bunching up this way again. And I'm going to finish off, but I'm going to leave a really long tail. And the length we're going for is three times wrapped around the longest part of the wing. So one, two, three. And I can trim that off there. So that is what that currently looks like. You are never going to be able to keep all of your stitches facing the same way, so try not to get too caught up on it. And so next we just need to add the veins in. So I'm going to use a darning needle for this, but a regular needle is fine as well. In fact, you could probably also use your hook for it, but a needle just feels a little bit more precise. I'm going to thread the end of my tail onto my needle and we are going to count 16 stitches up. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So that's this one here. Uh, it doesn't have to be super precise. It doesn't really matter if it's not your 16th stitch, but you're aiming for the, the furthest point of your wing for this. I'm just threading my needle up through both loops of that single crochet, like so. And then I'm threading it back down through the base. So it wraps completely around. So there is our, our first little vein. So then from whatever stitch you just worked through, count down towards the inner corner. We're going to go one, two, three, and then into the fourth stitch. And again, back through that same opening in the base. We're then going to do one last vein. You can leave it at two if you wanted to, but you know, one more, three is a good number. Uh, so that's the stitch we just went through and we're, and we're gonna count one, two, three, and then through the fourth stitch again. And back to our base. Now, don't pull these too tightly, but you do want them to like hold their strands, almost like a little harp. Then I'm just going to take our starting tail and the remainder of our current strand and just tie them in a knot like so. So there is our first wing and I'm going to do the same thing to the other one now like so. Keeping in mind that you do want them to be mirror images of each other not carbon copies of each other. There are the wings and you can leave these extra long tails on there if you've got as much left over as I do and use it to help secure your wings onto your bee in a minute. So now that we have all of our pieces we can assemble our little bug. So the wings are the most fragile piece so we'll be leaving those to last and we'll start with the legs. So your legs are all the same so it doesn't really matter which ones you grab but grab two of them to be your front legs. You want to squish them flat at the top and then line them up on the edge of this black stripe so that they point forwards. We're lining them up with the stitches to the point where they probably could have been joined in the round if we wanted. One on either side. I like my legs quite... wow, no we're not saying that. Um, I like to position the legs of my bee quite far apart. Oh, ah. 
I guess this is one of those uh, times we make a blood sacrifice to our creations to give them life. It's just a fact of crafting. So that's where mine are positioned. Now we will need to sew those on first before we can attach the others, but we're just going to pin everything in place for now so that uh, you get some idea of, of how this is going to look. So next you're going to grab your two middle legs and this time we're not pinching it. Instead we're just going to place that open end directly against the B, directly behind the first leg. And the same on the other side. So that's two little legs. Curse of the black yarn here. The last two legs we are once again pinching that opening shut and it should be on the other edge of that first black stripe pointing backwards. So pinch, position, and pin. So there are his little legs. You should pop him down on your surface and make sure that he stands up okay. And he does. So we are then just going to take some of our black yarn, pull the second and third legs off each side for now. Sorry guys, sorry Buzz, you're okay, you're fine. And we're going to just sew all six of the legs on. Okay, so next up we're going to grab our wings and once again looking at just this big black stripe we're going to grab our first wing and basically the side of the wing that has the veins on it should be on the inside so we're going to line the first one up about one row back in our black pretty much in line with one of your eyes So that that first side is straight down the back and do the same thing with the other one on the other side. I'm pretty happy with that position honestly. Normally I move them around a little bit more but I think I kind of just nailed it right off the bat there. So then we have these little pokey bits of wire that we have to worry about. So what I'm going to do is take my pins and just move them slightly off to one side in the B. Now they are just there to mark where I've positioned my wings so that I can pop them straight back exactly where they are and I'm going to take the little stem and bend it downwards at a 90 degree angle then I'm going to put them back on the bee where I've marked but this time I'm going to work the stem down into one of the gaps in between the stitches now if yours doesn't go in super easily what you can do is use your hook to poke the stuffing down where you want that stem to go, like so. So now pin it back in place and repeat for the other one. So now I'm just going to use sort of this remaining strand of white to sew on between those two orange stitches where I've marked. And there is your finished B. So there is our finished B. So we have the plain version, which is just sort of the basic B. And then we have our fancy B, who is just that little bit extra. So let me know in the comments, which one is your favorite? And I would love to know what is your favorite embroidery stitch? So it doesn't have to be one of the ones that I use today. Uh, if you've got a different favorite, I would love to know the name of it so that I can learn how to do it too and add it to, to the toolbox. Currently I am daydreaming about like the next marigold, you know, like a big dragon with all of her scales like individually like embroidered on. Yeah. 
But other than that, I will see you next week. Okay, bye. That was a really long video.